Hey guys, it is day 24 of our Bible reading plan, and today we are reading Genesis 35 through 37. Um, there's a lot of ground covered in this. Uh, Jacob returns to Bethel. It talks about the deaths of Rachel and Isaac. There's a long genealogy of Esau's descendants, and then we get into the account, the beginning of J Joseph's story. Um, but just a couple of things that stood out to me as I was reading, and something that I think is really important as you read through this account in the Bible, um, anytime that God reaffirms his covenant or reminds his people of his covenant or revisits that, I think is really important. And we find um, that at the beginning of 35, uh, we find it says, God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. And so he's Jacob is going to be going back to Bethel um, to the spot where he had the dream um, where God appeared to him. And it's interesting here, the text shows us the, the thing that he does is he prepares his household for that encounter. And he gets rid of all of the household idols that have come with them to this point and sort of consecrates, like he dedicates this time to the Lord. And it says that after Jacob returned from Padan Aram, in verse 9, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. Now, God's already done this once, right? When Jacob is on his way back to meet Esau again, he wrestles with God and God touches his hip and God calls him Israel. He changes his name. And so here's a revisiting of that. It's a repeat. Um, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you. Kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. So where he is at Bethel, again, God's confirming this land I give to you, and also I give you the land of your fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And he gives it to his descendants, so and to your descendants after you. Verse 13 says, Then God went up from him at that place where he had talked with him. One of the really interesting things about this is that God says to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. God also says that to Adam and Eve, and then they have kids. Well, right after this, we have the birth story of Jacob's last son, whom Rachel bears him. And it's not a happy celebratory story because in childbirth, Rachel dies. And it says that as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't despair for you have another son. And as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named him Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. And Ben-Oni is an uh, a name that means son of my trouble. And his father renames him to son of my right hand. Um, and it says, so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. Um, over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar. And to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. And so we have this account, this revisiting of God's promise over Jacob. And then we have this really sad loss that he experiences. And if you think about it, this section of text, it begins with a loss. Well, it begins with a promise of God and then a loss. And then another loss closes out his story and he loses Joseph, his favorite son. So he loses his favorite wife. He loses his favorite son. Really, he loses the things he cares most in the world about because Rachel was the only thing, if you think about Jacob's life, that he actually worked for. He took Esau's birthright. He didn't work hard to do that. He made some soup. He stole his blessing, and then he ran off and didn't even <laughs> get to enjoy it um, to protect his own life. But when he saw Rachel, she was worth it. She was worth seven years. And those days seem like th those years seem like days to him to work for her hand. And then he was willing, once he didn't receive her hand, to work another seven years for her. He loved her. She was his prized beloved woman and her son he loved and favored over his other sons. And it's interesting because the promise of God says that kings and nations will come from him. And after he loses Rachel, we have a genealogy, and it seems very short. 
He has 12 sons, but that genealogy seems very short in contrast to the genealogy that follows in chapter 36 of Esau's descendants. They're numerous. They're all over the place. They had to move far away from one another, um, Esau and Jacob, because their households become so great. But when you look at the accounts of their genealogies at this point in the story, he seems sort of small compared to his mighty brother. And then the son that is his favored son that he does have is lost to him. Um, I think it's interesting that God keeps reminding Jacob of his promise, that his promise is good, that he has a plan, and that, that those are the things in the moments where life doesn't make sense to us that we can fall back on. We might not see the end of the story in our lifetimes, but we can know that God is working all things according to his purposes and that he has a plan for us in this world. And we can know that because of what Jesus did for us, that the story that God is writing in this world is not over yet, but that it has only just begun and that God is working all things for his good purposes in this world. And we can remember that and we can take heart and have hope in the hardest of times because of it. So I hope that encourages you today. It encouraged, it encouraged me as I read it. Um, be blessed and have a great day, guys.